Corinthians tonight. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. So we're going to continue uh, looking at different mysteries in the Bible. And so uh, we did the mystery of the kingdom of God was the first one we did, or the kingdom of heaven, which is basically Jesus Christ and all those who are in Christ. That is what the kingdom of heaven is. And the promises that were to Abraham and his seed, the promises that were to Israel, those promises were uh, to Jesus Christ, who is the kingdom of heaven. We are a part of that. Those promises are to us. And then last week we talked about the mystery of the Gentiles, showing how it was something that was it was God's plan all along to have one group, one group, one people, all who are going to be a part of the kingdom of heaven, all who are going to heaven are only those who are in Christ, those who are the bride of Christ. They are all one, just like a husband and wife are no more twain. They are one. All those who are a part of the bride will be one with Christ. There is one bride. There is not a bride for the father and a separate bride for the son. That is, that is a bunch of garbage that's being taught in a lot of churches, but that is, I mean, false to the extreme. And so you can kind of see how those, those two mysteries, they kind of go together. And then you could, I think we, it would be okay to say that there was a third mystery that we covered a little bit last week, the mystery of Israel. Also, the fact that they as a people were broken off from the vine, but yet God still made a way of salvation for them. And he did that, not, and it, that way of salvation, it's not a different way than us. It's the exact same way as us. God concluded them all in unrighteousness, putting them exactly where we were before we got saved, therefore making it possible for them to get saved. They'll just call on the Lord for salvation. And so once again, uh, when you look at the mystery of Israel, if you want to call it that, um, it just it shows once again that we're all one. And there is neither Jew nor Greek, male nor female in Christ. You're all one in Christ. So uh, today though, I want to talk about what I would, what I call the mystery of the changed body. Okay. And now uh, let's go ahead and read first Corinthians chapter 15, verse 51. Now a dispensationalist would call this the mystery of the rapture and um, the dispensationalist one of, they will use this passage to prove that Matthew 24 is not the rapture. Because what they're saying is Paul is revealing a mystery here. He's revealing something that was not previously known before. And so if Paul's revealing the rapture to us here, then Matthew 24 can't be the rapture. But the truth is, Paul is not revealing the rapture here. The mystery that he's revealing here is how God is going to change our body. But I want to, I want to re start reading in verse 51 because the dispensationalists, if they're preaching on the mystery of the rapture and using this to prove a pre-trib rapture, they are going to start reading in verse 51. And so let's start reading there. It says, Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment in a twinkling of an eye at the last trump. For the trumpet shall sound and the dead shall be raised incorruptible and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption and this mortal must put on immortality. So when this corruptible shall have put on incorruption and this mortal shall have put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? The sting of death is sin and the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. So right here, uh, this passage is clearly talking about the rapture. No doubt about that. It is talking about the rapture, but I do not believe that the mystery, he's, I'm, I'm showing you a mystery, okay? This is no longer, the mysteries we've been looking at so far are no longer mysteries, okay? They were mysteries, but now they have been revealed. And Paul here is, in fact, revealing a mystery, but the mystery was not the rapture. The mystery is that God is going to change our bodies. That's the mystery. And so they do. They the, the dispensational crowd will take this and say Matthew 24 can't be the rapture because Paul is the one who revealed the rapture. And, but that that's completely foolish because if you read all of chapter 15, which is the classic mistake most Baptists make, they just cherry pick verses. They don't look at context. You have to look at context. And when you do, 
1 Corinthians 15, the whole chapter, is talking about a physical resurrection. And Paul, you know, he's not revealing the rapture, and he's not even re- revealing the resurrection of the last day. That we, uh, he's not, that's not what he's revealing because they already knew that this was coming. You know, the rapture was told about in Matthew 24, the resurrection of the last day. Martha mentioned that to Jesus, and that goes all the way back to Job. We'll look at that, a passage from there. I mean, so this, you know, they knew about these things. But he, what he is revealing to them here is how God was going to change our vile body into a spiritual body. That had not been revealed yet how that was going to happen. And so the first part of 1 Corinthians 15 is about the resurrection of Jesus Christ. It talks about that. And it explains that if there is no resurrection of the dead, you know, Christ is not risen. You know, and if Christ is not risen, our faith is in vain. Ye are yet in your sins. And so the resurrection of Christ is what proves that there is a resurrection for us. That there's a resurrection coming. And so this causes a question to spring up in people's mind. Okay, So forget that you know what you know about the Bible. Forget you have the whole Bible. Try to put yourself in more of a mindset of someone who just has the Old Testament and maybe just the Gospels. Okay, Maybe you just have that. Forget that you've read 1 Corinthians 15 for a minute. But if somebody comes along and they're telling you about the dead being raised and you being able to go into heaven and all that, you know, it's going to cause some questions. Well, you know, how do the dead come back to life? When they come back to life, what are they like? Are they going to look like they were when they died? Still old and decrepit? Well, that's no fun. You know, when they come back to life, are they going to look you know, rotted and deteriorated like a zombie uh, apocalypse or something, you know, or is it going to be, you know, you know, what's it going to be like? You know, it definitely causes some questions to spring up in people's minds, you know, and one of those questions is, you know, how are the dead raised and with what body do they come? We see that passage specifically. Uh, we're going to look at that here in a minute, but I want to show you though, that belief in a physical resurrection, it goes way back. It, you, we can read about it in Job. Turn over to Job chapter 19 and verse 23. Now, Job is the oldest writing of the Bible. Job was written before Genesis was written. Moses wrote Genesis through Deuteronomy. Job is the, it's not the first story chronologically, but it's the oldest book in the Bible. And Job in chapter 19, verse 23 He said, Oh, that my words were now written. Oh, that they were printed in a book, that they were graven with an iron pen and led in the rock forever. For I know that my Redeemer liveth, and he shall stand at the latter day upon the earth. And though after my skin worms destroy this body, yet in my flesh shall I see God, whom I shall see for myself, and mine eyes shall behold, and not another, though my reins be consumed within me. Now, Job here, he's speaking with great faith. He knows, he said, I know my Redeemer liveth. I know in the latter day, he's going to stand upon the earth. And he, Job knows that, you know, his body's going to deteriorate. It's going to be eaten of worms. But he says, in my flesh, I shall see God, whom I shall behold, mine eyes shall behold, and not another, though my reins be consumed within me, even though my body's going to rot and it's going to deteriorate, it's going to rise from the dead. Now, he doesn't explain how that's going to work, how that's going to happen. But what he does says, I know it's going to happen. He didn't get it. You know why? Because it was a mystery. This, how the resurrection was going to work was completely unknown to them back then. They knew there was going to be a resurrection. Daniel chapter 12 talks about, you know, a resurrection. But understand, they didn't know how it was going to, they didn't understand how it was going to work. They knew what happens to a body after it's buried. It deteriorates. It rots. That would cause people to think, you know, and I don't know who God first revealed the resurrection to. I I imagine they probably knew about it going back to Adam. But, you you know, you know, they had to be thinking maybe, you know, Adam, when they buried Abel, you know, or just when they saw someone who died, you know, they eventually learned that, you know what, bodies deteriorate and they rot and they eventually turn back into dust. And it had to make them scratch their head and say, how is that going to rise again? You know, it's, it's old, it's rotted, it's, it's, it's gone, it's dust. How can that rise again? That would have definitely been a question I think people would have had back in those days. 
And so let's go ahead and start reading in order to understand, you know, and to prove what the, the, what this mystery is all about. Once again, we have to look at context. And so let's go to first Corinthians chapter 15 and let's start reading in verse 12. And it says, now, if Christ be preached that he rose from the dead, how say some among you that there is no resurrection of the dead? Okay, that's referring to what we call the rapture. Okay, we call it the rapture because we hope we're going to be those who are alive and remain. And we know that that could be us, that we could be a part of that. And so we call it the rapture. But before that, in Job's day, he knew it was going to be a long way away until that day came. He knew he was going to die and his body was going to rot before that day came. But they talked, even the Pharisees believed in a resurrection. The Sadducees didn't believe in a resurrection. So the resurrection was something that was just, it was common knowledge. But there were always those like the Sadducees who said there is no resurrection of the dead. And Paul's saying, how could some of you say that? So even in the church, there's people that are saying that. No, there's no resurrection of the dead. And he says in verse 30, if there be no resurrection of the dead, then is Christ not risen? And if Christ be not risen, then is our preaching vain and your faith is also vain? We're wasting our time if there is no resurrection of the dead. I mean, why in the world do we waste our time being persecuted for the cause of Christ and being hated by the world if we're just eventually going to die and that's it? He says, there is a resurrection of the dead. And he said, if there's no, you know, and he said, yeah, and we are found false witnesses of God because we have testified of God that he raised up Christ whom he raised not up. If so be that the dead rise not. For if the dead rise not, then is not Christ raised. And if Christ be not raised, your faith is vain a year, yet in your sins. Then they also, and you know, that's interesting too for this crowd who always wants to scream, it is finished about Jesus on the cross. Well, according to the apostle Paul, if there is no resurrection, you're still in your sins. But no, you know, he, he finished it on the cross. He paid for our sins on the cross. It was finished. If there's no resurrection, you're still in your sins. Okay? His work on the cross was finished, but his work in whole was not done. And we actually see a lot more things that Jesus has still yet to do here. Now, he's going to do them. I think it's okay for us to say it is finished, even though it hasn't happened yet. Because God's, if God says it's going to happen, it's as good as done. We're just, we're just waiting for it to happen. But it says in verse 18, Then, also, uh, then they also which are fallen asleep in Christ are perished. Your loved ones are in hell if there is no resurrection of the dead. If in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men most miserable. But now is Christ risen from the dead and become the first fruits of them that slept. For since by man came death, by man came also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. But every man in his own order, Christ the first fruits. Afterward, they that are Christ, it is coming. Then cometh the end. When he shall have delivered up the kingdom to God, even the Father, when he shall have put down all rule, authority, and power. Now, when does that happen? That happens, I believe, after the millennium. Okay, That's going to happen after the millennium. It says, for he must reign till he hath put all enemies under his feet. The last enemy that shall be destroyed is death. All right, we, Death's not been destroyed yet. Okay? He's not done. There's still more to do. For he hath put all things under his feet. But when he saith all things are put under him, it is manifest that he is accepted, which should put all things under him. And when all things shall be subdued unto him, then shall the Son also himself be subject unto him that put all things under him, that God may be all in all. Else what shall they do that are baptized for the dead if the dead rise not at all? Why are they then baptized for the dead? And why stand we in jeopardy every hour? Why are we surrounding ourselves with death? Why are we going through these things? Why are we going to be in jeopardy every hour if the dead rise not? It's very clear those early Christians, they didn't seem like they cared that much about their life. You know why? Because they knew this life wasn't all there was. And you know what? They wanted to have that better resurrection. And those people were fools to die the way they did if there is no resurrection of the dead. But you know what? They weren't fools. They were wise for doing what they did. And they're going to have a better resurrection. Those who died, those who were martyred, they did not die in vain. And he said, I protest by your rejoicing, which I have in Christ Jesus, our Lord. I die daily. If after the manner of men, I have fought with the beast at Ephesus, what advantage it me if the dead rise not? Let us eat and drink for tomorrow we die. You know, let's live like the rest of the world is. That's their attitude, isn't it? Because they're thinking, you know, 
you only, you know, YOLO, you only live once. And, you know, we're going to, you might as well get all you can out of this life. And we all see how that's a pretty miserable existence. And these people are fools because one of these day, nights, their soul is going to be required of them. But it says, be not deceived, evil communications, corrupt good manners, awake to righteousness and sin not. For some have not the knowledge of God. I speak this to your shame. But some man will say, how are the dead raised up? And with what body do they come? Now, I don't know. Maybe I'm missing something here, but I think that's a good question. You know, how are the dead raised up? How does this work? You know, and with what body do they come? What's it going to be like when they rise from the dead? I said, are they going to be a deteriorated zombie? Are they going to be just like they were before they died? Are they going to be young again? You know, they say there's no such thing as a dumb question, right? Well, the Apostle Paul would disagree because he says, Thou fool, that which thou sowest is not quickened except it die. You know, so I guess he thought it was kind of a dumb question. But, he said, but you know, he just, he's given him an example here. That which thou sowest is not quickened except it die. A seed, okay? You'll take that seed, you know, that grows from a plant, and you put it in the ground, and it, it dies and it deteriorates, but then it ends up growing into a plant, okay? If I was holding a seed here, a seed for a tree or whatever, you know, you wouldn't call that a tree, would it? You'd call it a seed. But after that seed dies, it gets turned in to a tree. It gets changed into something else. And so it says, um, and that which thou sowest, thou sowest not that body that shall be, but bare grain. It may chance of wheat or of some other grain. So what you're putting in the ground is not what will be. Okay. You're putting in a seed, but you're expecting it to be something else. Okay. But God giveth it a body as it hath pleased him and to every seed, his own body. All flesh is not the same flesh, but there is one kind of flesh of men, another flesh of beasts, another of fishes, another of birds. There are also celestial bodies and bodies terrestrial, but the glory of the celestial is one, the glory of the terrestrial is another. There is one glory of the sun, another glory of the moon, and another glory of the stars. For one star differeth from another star in glory. So also is the resurrection of the dead. It is sown in corruption. It is raised in incorruption. It is sown in dishonor. It is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness. It is raised in power. It is sown a natural body. It is raised a spiritual body. What goes into the ground is not necessarily what's going to come out of the ground. Just like with the seed, same thing with our body. It says it is, uh, there is a natural body and there is a spiritual body. And so it is written. The first man, Adam, was made a living soul. The last Adam was made a quickening spirit. How be it? That was not first, which is spiritual, but that which is natural, and afterward, that which is spiritual. Adam came before Jesus, didn't he? Adam was physical. Adam was made from the dust of the earth. Jesus came later, that which was spiritual. And in Adam, we all die, and we all come from Adam. We all had the natural man first. But then later, we became a spiritual man through Jesus Christ, the last Adam. And so that's what all that's talking about. The first man is of the earth, talking about Adam, earthy, which is what the name Adam means, earthy. The second man is the Lord from heaven. As is the earthy, such are they also that are earthy. And as is the heavenly, such are they also that are in heavenly. Okay, so just like we are sinful because we are of the earthy, because we descend from Adam, one of these days, we are going to be like Christ because we, we, are, we are born of God. And we will take on that spiritual body and have that spiritual nature. We'll be like Christ. As we have borne the image of the earthy, we shall also bear the image of the heavenly. Now this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, neither doth corruption inherit incorruption. Okay, so now we have the context before we get to verse 51. Behold, I show you a mystery. Okay, has he been talking about the rapture at all before verse 50? No, he's been talking about, he's trying to explain to them where this new body comes from, what kind of body it is. That's the mystery, not the rapture. They are not asking about that. They're asking how the dead rise and with what body you know, do, do they come with. And he's explaining this to them. 
he's telling them about how, you know, we have this natural body, but just like a seed, you know, it's going to, it's going to be sown in corruption and it's going to be raised in incorruption. It's to sown a natural body. It's going to be raised a spiritual body. It's crystal clear when you look at it, even if you just read the passage, it's clear what it's talking about. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. The mystery is not the rapture. The mystery is the changed body. That's what he's been talking about this whole time. And there's, there's two reasons why they want to call this the, say he's revealing the mystery of the rapture. Two reasons, because one, it helps advance the idea that Matthew 24 is not the rapture, which is false. But if they get the context of this right and they look at verse 50, do you realize that verse 50 all by itself absolutely destroys the false doctrine of Zionism? Because what does Zionism teach? That the Jews, the physical descendants of Abraham, are God's chosen people. That the millennial kingdom, it's for the Jews, the physical seed of Abraham. But it says in verse 50 that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of heaven. So this creates a couple of problems here. Okay, because when does the change body take place? Well, it takes place at the rapture, correct? Well, even the dispensationalists, they don't believe the Jews are going to be changed during that time. So then there is another resurrection that comes later, but that's at the end of the millennium. Okay, so when did the Jews get transformed into a spiritual body? Okay, even if they all get saved, all right, even if they're right, even if pre-trib's right, and then a whole bunch of Jews get saved in the tribulation, how are they going to inherit the kingdom of God when they're still flesh and blood? They have to have that changed body. That can only happen one or two times, either at the rapture or at the end of the millennium. So where do we get this idea that a physical people are going to get the kingdom of God on earth? They can't because flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. Oh, you know, the kingdom, then, then they'll try to go into the kingdom of God, kingdom of heaven or different stuff. But listen, go, go to John chapter three, John chapter three, because you'll say, well, he's talking to the church here. Well, let's see what happens when Jesus was talking to a Jew. Okay. When Jesus was talking to a Jew in John chapter three, Jesus answered and said unto him, verily, verily, I say unto thee, except the man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus saith unto him, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter the second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, Except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. So Jesus said the exact same thing, talking to a Jew who was looking for a kingdom, he said, except you be born, born again, you cannot see the kingdom of God. Well, what does he mean there? Well, that's just seeing the kingdom of God, not entering the kingdom of God. Well, the thing is, how do you enter the kingdom of God? Well, you got to believe Christ. How do you see Christ? You, know, you, have, you have to believe him. It's not just physically looking at him. You have to believe on him. And if you're not even going to if, you know, believe on him, you're not going to be born again. You're not going to see the kingdom of God. And you're not going to enter into the kingdom of heaven. You know why? Because that which is born of the flesh is flesh. And flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. And so it is, it is very clear. Verse 50, they're not, you know, people don't want to start reading at verse 50 because that destroys Zionism. And you know, John chapter 3 destroys Zionism all by itself right there. And so it is crystal clear that what he's talking about here, what, for the whole mystery of 1 Corinthians 15, it is about the changed body. And so notice how the rest of chapter 15, you know, it doesn't focus on the elements of the rapture, but it focuses on what happens to our bodies. Okay? That's what the focus is. And if, if this is the first time that the Corinthians had heard about the rapture, okay, if Paul's revealing the rapture to them here, he didn't do a real good job explaining it, did he? Because he didn't talk a whole lot about the elements of the rapture. He, you know, he didn't say that much about it. And you would think, if they're, whoa, whoa, wait a minute, what's this? 
What's this about a rapture? What's this about being caught up? What's this about, you know, we shall, we shall not all sleep. You know, what, what is that all about? No, it's clear these people knew about it. He probably talked about it before. Well, you know, why don't we read about it? Well, you know, he doesn't tell us everything he talked about. But it, Matt, but Matt said Matthew 24 is when the rapture was revealed. Very clearly, talking about the angels gathering him up, the sound of the trumpet, all that. But, you know, he, the elements he does get into are interesting because they're all, you know, they're mentioned in Matthew 24. But, you know, he says, and this, and the, you know, people too, they take this verse when it says in a moment, a twinkling of an eye. And that's kind of what helps advance their whole secret rapture idea that we're just sometime at any moment, just the trumpet's going to sound and boom, we're gone just like that. And, you know, for the lost, they're just going to be looking at you one moment and then boom, you're just going to vanish. Your clothes are going to drop to the ground. That is not what the Bible teaches. Okay. The Bible doesn't teach we're going to get caught up in a twinkling of an eye. That's not what, it's not talking about the rapture here and being caught up. It's talking about the changed body. And it says um, in verse 52, it says in a moment in the twinkling of an eye at the last trump for the trumpet shall sound and the dead shall be raised incorruptible and we shall be changed. What the last trump there means, it's not the last trump is in the seventh trumpet. It doesn't mean the last trumpet. The tr- a trump is the sound that the trumpet makes. And so at the last sound of it, so I don't know if the Lord is, because I believe God's going to blow the trumpet. It's the trump of God. And you can look in the Old Testament and, t- and see a verse where it talks about God blowing a trumpet. And so God is going to blow a trumpet. And I don't know if it's going to, he's going to like play several different notes, you know, like a reveille type thing. And then at the last note is when we go up or if it's going to be one long blast. And as soon as it stops, we go because we know there's a lot of things involved when the rapture comes. The sun's going to be dark and the moon's going to be turned to blood. The stars are going to withdraw their shining. All of a sudden, we're going to the sign of the Son of Man will appear in the heavens, uh, and you know all the tribes of the earth shall mourn. Every every eye is going to see him when he comes in the clouds. And you know, and but we know when we see him, we immediately are going to be changed. And so I do. I believe that the mo- I, I believe we're going to hear a trumpet. It's going to get our attention. And as that trumpet blasts, as the sky gets dark, as the earth begins to quake, it's going to get our attention. And we are going to look and all of a sudden, at the, while we're hearing that trumpet, as soon as it hits that last note or that last trump, there he is. And when we see him, immediately we will be different. Immediately, we will have that new body. And at that same time, when we rise, when he shouts, the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout. I will, I, even the dead are going to hear his voice. And those who are, uh, who are saved, they, those who believe in him, though they were dead. Yes, shall they, how how'd that go? He said that in John chapter 11. Talks about even the dead. Even if them being, I can't remember exactly, but they're going to hear his voice. Those are in the graves who are the dead in Christ. They're going to hear his voice and they are going to rise from the dead and they are going to be changed. They are going to have that new body. And that was not talked about in Matthew 24. It didn't talk about the dead rising. It didn't talk about the changed body. And, you know, the dispensationalists like to take that and say that proves it's something different because things that are different are not the same. And that's just stupid because as long as things don't conflict with each other, okay, it's it, at the post trip conference. That was one of the arguments I showed, I, I, I debunked. They use that things that are different are not the same, but that is a foolish thing to say because the way I explained it there, if I was given a description or if, if you were given a description, Brother Lonnie, he's given a description of me to the police because maybe he saw me do something. He's like, you know, he's wearing a blue suit, he's got a blonde comb over hair. You know, and he's wearing uh, blue pants and uh, black shoes. And then Brother Mark goes and he gives the exact same description, but he adds and he has a beard. The police aren't going to say, oh, man, we thought you had the same guy, but they gave different descriptions and things that are different are not the same. No, they're talking about the same person. And there was no con, there was no confliction with what was said. 
And those, they might have said different things in a different order or whatever, but it was clearly the same event. That doesn't disprove anything. And we see here that in 1 Corinthians 15, it's the same event. It's just focusing on different details. It's focusing on the changed body. Explain how that's going to happen. And so that was something that was not revealed before. But it's being, it's be, being revealed now. So it's focusing on what's happened to our bodies. So, uh, you know, he talks about the resurrection, the sounding of Trump, but I believe he's talking about that like it's something that they knew about. And it's probably because they did. He had probably told them about Matthew 24. I'm sure that story had gotten spread around quite a bit in the early church. And so we see that the changed body is our blessed hope. Okay. Turn to Titus chapter 2, verse 11. Titus chapter 2, verse 11. The pre-trib crowd... When they hear our preaching on this, they accuse us of stealing their blessed hope. You're taking away my blessed hope. You know, the blessed hope is the rapture. And it's that it could come at any time. They they just add these things to it. You're not allowed to give your own definitions for things. But let me show you what the blessed hope actually is. It says in Titus 2 verse 11, For the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. If I could take a jab at the trendies right now, too, you got in the trendy crowd, they all use grace as an excuse to sin and live ungodly. But the Bible teaches that the grace of God, it teaches us to deny ungodliness. The grace of God teaches us to stay away from garbage, okay? They kind of teach the opposite. It teaches us that we are supposed to be different. It teaches us that we are supposed to purify ourselves, that we're supposed to be trying to be like Christ. The grace of God teaches us that. Verse 13, it's teaching us to be godly in this present world, not in the future. Right now, we're supposed to be godly. And it's supposed to cause us to looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto himself a peculiar people, zealous of good works. These things speak and exhort and rebuke with all authority. Let no man despise thee. We are looking, we want to be like Christ. That should be our desire. Well, when is that going to happen? When will we no longer be sinful? At the rapture. Okay? So listen, the blessed hope, it's not... Okay, the blessed hope happens at the rapture, okay? But understand, for most people today, when they're talking about, you know, the rapture is my blessed hope. You know, my blessed hope is that Jesus could come back tomorrow and I won't have to figure out how to pay my bills. I won't have to get any more calls from the credit card company. You know, I won't have to worry about how I'm going to afford to buy my spoiled brats, all those Christmas presents. You know, I just wish the Lord would come back tomorrow and I believe he could. That's my blessed hope. But the Bible is teaching us in here that, no, our blessed hope is that someday we're going to be like Christ. That's not what people, that's when people are like, man, I sure hope Jesus comes back today. It's because they're sick of all their problems. They're sick of just all the junk in their life because of the sin in their life. They're not saying that because they just want to be like Christ. Because if they really did want to be like Christ, you know what they would be doing? They would be purifying themselves. They, you know, every man that hath this hope in him purifieth himself, even as he is pure. If these people were actually looking for the blessed hope, the Bible teaches that they would be living more godly lives. But are they living more godly lives? You know, it's it's amazing. You know, the pre-trib crowd they act like the fact that we're post-trib and we don't believe that the rapture could come back tonight is giving us an excuse to get lazy and not do anything for God, and then you know we're just going to wait until all the signs start happening, tribulation comes, then we're going to get on fire for God. They say that that's what our teaching will lead to, but whose teaching is actually leading to that? It's the pre-trib crowd. They're as lazy as all get out. They're not interested in soul winning right now. All they're interested in right now is just, they're in survival mode, just trying to keep their community fund centers alive that they have. They're not out there winning souls and getting on fire for God. They're not even preaching hard against sin. It's a post-trib crowd that's doing that. And so, you know, their, their arguments, first of all, they're just not even biblical. But then what they accuse, uh, you know, the, 
What they say our teaching will cause is what their teaching has already caused. And so the blessed hope is just not that we can escape all our problems tomorrow. It's a one day, hey, I'm actually going to be like Christ. And if you believe that, you'll start working on it right now. Turn over to Romans chapter 8 and verse 18. Roman, and, and what the pre-trib crowd does too, because it calls it the blessed hope right there, they'll take verses about hope and use that, any verses about hope, that proves pre-trip. Because like all verses about hope are now about the rapture, and my hope is that it could come today. And so now when you see hope, that's, you know, it has nothing, it might not even have anything to do with the rapture, but they will use that as, you know, a pre-trib proof verse. Once again, failing to look at context, which is always their undoing. But Romans chapter 8, verse 18 says, for I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared to the glory which shall be revealed in us. For the earnest expectation of the creature waiteth for the manifestation of the Son of God, sons of God. For the creature was made subject to vanity, not willingly, but by reason of him who hath subjected the same in hope. Because the creature itself also shall be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation groaneth and travaileth in pain together until now. And not only they, but ourselves also, which have the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves groan within ourselves, waiting for the adoption to wit the redemption of our body. Okay? We have the first fruits of the Spirit, but we're waiting for something. Okay? We're waiting for the redemption of our body. That has not happened yet. For we are saved by hope. But hope that is seen is not hope. For what a man seeth, why doth he yet hope for? But if we hope for that we see not, then we do we with patience wait for it. Likewise, the Spirit also helpeth our infirmities. For we know not what we should pray for as we ought. But the Spirit itself maketh intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. And he that searcheth the hearts knoweth what is the mind of the Spirit because he maketh intercession for the saints according to the will of God. And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them that are called according to His purpose. For whom He did foreknow, He also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of His Son, that He might be the firstborn among many brethren. Moreover, whom He did predestinate, them He also called. And whom He also called, them He also justified. And whom He justified, them He also glorified. So we see here in this passage, it's talking a lot about hope. And what's it talking about? It's how we're waiting for the redemption of our body. We want that new body because we want to be like Christ. Now, how often do you see these crowds that are just looking for Jesus to come? You hear them talking about how they just want to be more godly and how they want to be more Christ-like. No, it's always, they're just wanting to escape from the problems of this world. They don't glory in tribulation. They're terrified of tribulation. You know, it's always, it's just about, you know, and, and the problems that they have, the things they're wanting to run from are because they're just living so wicked. And yet they don't blame their wickedness for the problems in their life. They blame the world. I just want to get out of this world because I'm tired of dealing with the junk. Well, you realize the reason you're so miserable, it's not just because of the world, it's because you're sinful. And if you, if you were spiritual at all, you would realize that. And you would start working on that and you would start getting close to the Lord and it would cause you to start having a desire to be like Christ. And we understand that when the day finally comes where we are just like Christ, it's when we're in heaven. And at that, or when, at the, when the rapture comes, he will change us. And so look at Romans chapter 13. Romans chapter 13, verse 11. It says, and that knowing that the time, knowing the time that it is now high time to awake out of our sleep, for now is our salvation nearer than when we believe. The night is far spent, the day is at hand. Let us therefore cast off the works of darkness and let us put on the armor of light. Let us walk honestly as in the day, not in riding and drunkenness, not in chambering and wantonness, not in strife and envying, but put ye on the Lord Jesus Christ and make not provision for the flesh to fulfill the lust thereof. So we see in that passage, it says our salvation is nearer than when we believe. So wait, our salvation isn't here yet? Not the salvation of our bodies. And I like how it says that now is our salvation nearer than when we believed. Well, when we believed, that was when our soul was saved. Okay, But our body is not saved yet. Our body gets saved at the rapture. 
And at the rapture, and how does how does the body get saved? God changes it. He changes it in the moment in a twinkling of an eye. He makes it a spiritual body, one that is like Christ. And so right now we deal with sin because we are of Adam and he fell. But Jesus Christ, he never sinned. He died and he rose again. And so all of us who have believed in him, we have been born again. And eventually we will bear the image of the heavenly we and that moment will come at Christ's return. And so that is what we are looking for. That is our blessed hope. Looking for that blessed hope, a changed body, one that's like Christ, and the glorious appearing. Why are we looking for that? Because that's when we get the blessed hope. At his appearing. Oh, glorious appearing is Armageddon. When Christ, who is our life, shall appear, then shall we also appear with him in glory. You know, beloved. Now are we the sons of God. Mention the one verse. We're waiting for the manifestation of the sons of God. Okay. We are sons of God right now, but it does not yet appear what we shall be. For we know that we will be like him for we shall see him as he is. It changes. It all happens when we see him. That is, that is what that mystery is. And so our souls are saved now, but our bodies are not. So right now, Right now, we are a people of faith. And we will be a people un- of faith until our faith becomes sight. When does that happen? And Lord, haste the day when my faith shall be sight. The clouds be rolled back as a scroll. The trump shall resound. The Lord shall descend. Even so does well with my soul. Until then... Until the rapture, we are people of faith. Turn over to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. We'll close with this. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. All pre-tribbers should quit singing the last verse of it as well with my soul. You know how bad it aggravates me when I watch them get all excited when they sing the clouds be rolled back as a scroll. That happens in Revelation chapter 6 after the tribulation at the sixth seal. Okay, it's, It's biblical. But these people don't believe that's the rapture. So why are they singing about it and getting all excited about it? Well, they're singing and they're getting excited about it because the Holy Spirit's telling them that's it. That's the rapture. But then when they start thinking with their dumb heads, no, that's not the rapture. You know, they should get excited when they sing that. But it's hypocritical when they'll get up and they'll teach that Matthew 24 and Revelation and, you know, Revelation 6 you know, it's, it's not the rapture. Or Revelation 7 is not the rapture. It's, it really is a joke. But 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 1, For we know that if our earthly house of this tabernacle were dissolved, we have a building of God and house made with hands eternal in the heavens. For in this we groan, earnestly desiring to be clothed upon with our house which is from heaven. If so, being clothed, we shall not be found naked, For we that are in this tabernacle do groan, being burdened, not for that we would be unclothed, but clothed upon, that mortality might be swallowed up of life. Now he that wrought us for the selfsame thing is God, who also hath given unto us the earnest of the Spirit. Therefore we also, we are always confident, knowing that whilst we are at home in the body, we are absent from the Lord, for we walk by faith and not by sight. We are confident, I say, and willing rather to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. Wherefore, we labor that whether present or absent, we may be accepted of him. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ that everyone may receive the things done in his body according to the done, whether it be good or bad. You see here that while we are in this body, we walk by faith and not by sight. And that is why salvation, it is by faith and without the works of the law. Because they that are in the flesh cannot please God. You could not, you are, no man is capable of repenting of their sins enough to the point where God's going to look at them and say, you know what, you're now acceptable. And that's why it's so foolish to teach you have to repent of your sins to be saved. Because we can't do it. On the best day you ever had, you still were sinful in the eyes of God. But thank God he made a way of salvation for us that is without works, it's of faith. And until we get our new body, 
We walk by faith and not by sight. But when we see him, we don't have, there's no need for faith anymore because we've seen him. You know, it, it's, it's now not faith. It's sight. And we, at that moment, when we see him, we are immediately changed in that spiritual body. And it is not about faith anymore for us. But until then, as long as we are in this body, we are a people of faith. And we see also there in that chapter how we are growing. We are waiting for the body. You know, I'm just going to be, I'll just be honest. I'm not trying to be unspiritual or anything, but you know what? I don't really like the faith way. You know, I'd rather see it for myself. I would rather see heaven than just believe the heavens there by faith. You know, I would rather see Jesus Christ than just to, just to believe him. But you know what? That's not how it works. You know, blessed are they that have not seen and yet believe. We've been called to be a people of faith. And so, you know what? I'm fine with doing that until Jesus Christ comes back. And so in, in the meantime, you know, we're still in this body and this, you know, these crazy camp meeting, repent of your sins crowd that always talk about their changed lives and, you know, how, you know, the, when they got saved, they really got saved and the Lord just totally transformed them. And, you know, they were all these terrible things. And now they're this, you know, you know, big, fat, pompous preacher, you know, that is the greatest thing in the world just because he hasn't smoked a cigarette in 30 years. You know, I'm sorry. You know, the apostle Paul, who was better than any of these guys ever thought about being, said, oh, wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? You know, I worry about guys who are that impressed with themselves, who look, who use their lives as an example of someone who's really saved. Are you serious? Do you know the first thing about something? I mean, you, you cannot be reading your Bible. You cannot know a thing about Jesus Christ for you to use yourself as an example, well, let me tell you how you can know you're saved, folks. Let me give you my testimony. You know, I was out drinking and, you know, at the bar one day. And then I, I, you know, was on the way home and I heard the radio preacher. You know, I had a head-on collision with the Holy Ghost. And then I, I never drank again. I never did this again. I, I started going to church. I got my hair cut, you know. I got my tattoos removed. You know, I, I did all these, you know, they'll talk about all these things they did. And then I worry about some of you. Say you're saved and you can't even be in church on a regular basis. Say you're saved and you don't even give your tithes and your offerings. You know. Say you're saved and you know you're wearing skinny jeans or something like that. You know, that do you know how sick that must make God? Do you think just because you put on a suit and tie and you got a haircut that now you measure up to Christ? What is wrong with these people? We walk by faith. And not by sight. These people aren't groaning to be changed and being like Christ. These people think they've arrived. And they use themselves as proof that everyone else isn't saved. What in the world? We've got a twisted, messed up group of people out there that are calling themselves Baptists. And it's about time, high time they change the name of their church. It really is. I'm getting sick of it. Oh, wretched man that I am, who should deliver me from the body of this death? You know what he's saying? I'm anxious to get out of this body and I want to get my new body. That's what people do have a blessed hope. We are looking for the changed body. Those of us who believe that salvation is by believing in the Lord Jesus Christ and that it is not of works, has nothing to do with the works of the law, we don't use that as an excuse to sin. We just believe that because that's what the Bible says. And those of us who are saved, we're just like, you know what? I can't wait to get out of this sinful body because we're still not impressed with ourselves. Because the question I have for these guys who say, you know, I, I worry about a salvation that won't even get you into church, that won't even get you in the baptistry. My question is, how in the world can you have the Holy Spirit in you and be impressed with yourself? Where does that come from? That's why I'm wondering if you're saved, if you say you have the Holy Spirit and you are telling everybody about your haircut is proof that you got saved. I'm sorry, there's something seriously wrong with that. And you know what? As much fun as it is going to camp meetings and watching people run around and making fool of themselves, it's a bunch of garbage that's being taught in those things. And we shouldn't have any part of it. It's, it's ridiculous. 
we are, we are looking for the blessed hope. We are looking for the changing of our body. And that was a mystery. It's not a mystery anymore. It's something that God is, it's, that God is going to do. It's going to happen when we see him. And so that is the mystery of the changed body. So with that, let's all stand together.